We do not know the name of the artist who created this watercolour, which is in the collection of the Yale Centre for British Art, but the catalogue entry states that it was finished by Thomas Sandby and Paul Sandby, two brothers who were among the most prolific English watercolourists of the latter half of the 18th century. Paul Sandby was a teacher of art, and this may be the work of one of his pupils, which he then completed. This painting is undated, but a date of around 1780 seems likely. The picture offers a view of civil engineering works on the banks of the River Thames in the vicinity of London. A large wooden structure has been erected on the river bank. Groups of men are at work in and around this structure, and work is also going on further along the river bank. Hand-pushed wagons are being used to convey material of some kind in the background, and there are boats tied up at a wharf with buildings and cranes. Moored a short distance from the bank is a shabby-looking ship with only one mast. A man and a woman are talking in the foreground. She is seated on the shaft of a two-wheeled cart. She is the only woman in the picture, is dressed as a respectable working woman from a farm or tavern with a basket beside her. Her clothing is helpful in dating the picture. The river is busy with traffic of various kinds. The masts of many ships are visible in the distance. The far bank of the river is low and shows few landmarks. The sun is beyond the right-hand edge of the picture and relatively low in the sky to judge from the long shadows. The quality of the light and the foliage on the trees suggest that it is late afternoon on a fine high summer or early autumn day. The work that is being carried out is the consolidation of the riverbank by driving piles, long pieces of timber, vertically into the ground. This will strengthen the bank, reducing the effects of erosion and providing a foundation for further construction. A heavy weight, called a ram, is being used to pound the pile into the ground. The ram is hoisted using a line running from a windlass through a pulley wheel on the top of the wooden framework, and then repeatedly raised and dropped by turning the windlass. It descends under its own weight, striking the top of the pile and hammering it into the ground. This repeated raising and releasing of the ram is tiring work for the men turning the windlass. The wooden structure, which resembles colliery headgear but is of lighter construction, is designed to be moved along, parallel to the riverbank, enabling a series of piles to be fixed in place. It is temporarily secured at each location by lines tied to the trees along the bank. Pile driving is a long established construction process, a 17th century method creating a solid foundation for the construction of a building is illustrated here with a team of nine men being needed to operate the pile driving machine. The navigational and industrial improvements of the 18th century Embanking rivers, building bridges, constructing docks, harbours, warehouses and factories required the pounding of thousands of wooden piles into the banks of the Thames. This late 18th century engraving shows a pile-driving machine used to build the second Westminster Bridge in London, which was opened in 1750. This machine uses a team of horses to provide the power to drive the piles.
The work we are looking at here is smaller in scale, and human labour is sufficient. But where is this work going on, and who is doing it? That is where this interesting and apparently harmless depiction of 18th century civil engineering takes a darker turn. Let's have a close look at the figures in this painting, and particularly at the men who are doing the work. They are dressed in workaday, and in some cases quite ragged, clothing. Breeches and shirts, with jerkins and waistcoats. They could be sailors, farm workers, or ordinary labourers of the kind who worked on all kinds of building and engineering projects in the 18th century. But they are wearing something else. Chains. These men wear fetters, and heavy chains hang from their waists, wrists, and ankles. There are other figures in the picture who do not wear chains and are not involved in the manual work. This man is carrying a drawn cutlass as is this man, who seems to be supervising men shifting spoil further down the bank. This one carries a long musket, with bayonet fixed. On the wharf in the background are more armed figures, and what seems to be a sentry box. The men in chains are prisoners. The armed guards are just that, prison warders and soldiers. There is another clue to the status of these workers. This ship, with only one cut-down mast, a roof built out from the deck, washing hanging from its residual rigging, and a generally run-down appearance, is a floating prison, a convict hulk. Between 1718 and 1775, at least 40,000 people were condemned to transportation by British courts and sent to the American colonies. The American Revolution ended that practice, forcing the British government to find new convict accommodation at home. The Hulks Act of 1776 was the result, which laid down that, in the place of transportation to His Majesty's colonies and plantations in America, such convicts, being males, might be employed with benefit to the public in raising sand, soil and gravel from and cleansing the River Thames, or being males unfit for so severe a labour, or being females, might be kept to hard labour of another kind within England. The hulks were converted merchant and naval vessels, often in poor condition and unseaworthy. The convicts were paid for the labour they performed, receiving their money on release, and there were facilities for them to learn to read and write and to acquire craft skills. But the work was savagely hard, the living conditions and food were dreadful, disease was rife, discipline harsh, and the guards brutal. The Hulk system soon spread across the country, with dozens moored at Portsmouth, Deptford, Chatham, Woolwich, Plymouth, and other locations, holding thousands of men. The only Hulk for women, the Dunkirk at Plymouth, operated from 1784 to 1791, Women sentenced to hard labour were generally held in houses of correction. During the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, the system was expanded to accommodate prisoners of war. The hulks remained in use until 1856, when the hulk system was abolished and the last convicts were moved to land prisons. By this time, transportation to the Australian colonies had been in use for many years, with hulks used as receiving ships for convicts on their way to Australia, although as late as 1840, more than two-thirds of all incarcerated convicts in England were held in the hulks. The presence of the hulk, the type of work the men are carrying out, and the geography of the site, provide some clues as to the location of this painting. It is almost certainly Woolwich, on the Thames estuary east of Greenwich. A number of prison hulks were moored at Woolwich, on both southern and northern sides of the river, from 1776 until the very end of the hulk system in 1856. Their proximity to London made them particularly notorious. 
they were known as a floating academy of crime, a seminary of vice, in which an offender grows old in iniquity and forms connections for future depredations, according to a letter in the Public Advertiser of 22nd October 1781. Samuel Ireland, in his Picturesque Views on the River Thames of 1792, wrote of the hulks lying off Woolwich, in which near three hundred wretched convicts are confined, as a scene on our river that it were to be wished could be removed. Some of the hulks can be seen in this drawing from 1777, and a pile-driving machine can also be seen on the right. Woolwich was an important part of Britain's military infrastructure. The Woolwich Arsenal, Woolwich Dockyard, and the Royal Military Academy, where Paul Sandby was chief drawing master from 1768 to 1796, were located there. These sites, with the town of Woolwich itself, were situated on the southern side of the Thames. The flood-prone and marshy northern side, now known as North Woolwich, a name dating from the coming of the railways in the 1840s, remained mostly undeveloped until well into the 19th century. If we are near Woolwich, where precisely are we? It is not easy to identify any particular site and the shadows are anomalous. They lead away from the river, indicating that the sun is on the right, and thus that we are on the north bank of the Thames, perhaps on the opposite shore to Woolwich itself, and facing east. However, there are buildings, and a notable concentration of masts on the left, perhaps indicating the yard and wharfs at Woolwich, suggesting that we are a little downriver from the town, on the southern bank. Furthermore, in the extreme distance is a large domed building, surely intended for St Paul's Cathedral. That would be consistent with the viewpoint of the picture being on the south bank, looking upstream and thus to the west, towards the city of London. Perhaps the original anonymous artist simply got his shadows wrong. The only safe conclusion to be drawn is that this scene is set at or near Woolwich, at a site where convicts from the Woolwich prison hulks are at work. The work done by the convicts from the hulks, as shown by this print from the London magazine of May 1777, was heavy manual labour in and around the arsenal and dockyard and along the river. Building embankments and wharfs, strengthening riverbanks against erosion, digging out and transporting ballast and conveying it in wheeled barrows to where it was needed, and operating the pile-driving machines. The descriptions shown here are the contemporary ones. A correspondent in the July 1777 Scots magazine reported that there were over 200 convicts at work at Woolwich, and that a party is continually busied in turning round a machine for driving piles to secure the embankment from the rapidity of the tides. In this illustration from 1777, no fewer than four pile-driving machines are visible. The same writer went on to describe the chaining of the convicts. They have fetters on each leg, with a chain between that ties variously, some round their middle, others upright to the throat. Some are chained two and two, and others, whose crimes have been enormous, with heavy fetters. He also emphasised the heavy security that surrounded the convicts, writing that a number of guards are continually walking about them with drawn cutlasses, to prevent their escape, and likewise prevent idleness. Pile driving on the banks of the Thames might appear at first glance to belong to that extensive body of 18th century artistic output 
that celebrated the industrial and technological achievements of the age, depicting in an unproblematic way the engineering triumphs that underlay the age of improvement and industrial revolution. But a close look reveals a reality that is more complex and darker. The prison ship, the convicts in fetters, and the warders and guards armed with guns and cutlasses are one aspect of that dark history. But there is also a Royal Navy cutter patrolling the river, identifiable by its long man-of-war's pennant. Not an unusual presence near a naval dockyard, but still an expression of state authority and armed force. And, in the distance, on the far bank of the river, a gallows stands, stark and isolated, from which a gibbeted body, very likely that of an executed pirate, swings, as a warning to all passing seafarers. Once you know where to look and how to look, there are many details in this image that reveal the dark currents of hidden history flowing beneath the surface of this outwardly unremarkable riverside scene.